we have an opportunity to highlight um, a range of faculty uh, um, projects which involve students across a variety of colleges here on the campus. Um, this includes Engineers Without Borders um, from Kenya to Guatemala, um, Dick Schmidt and Kelly Berman will be talking about that. Um, also the Center for International Human Rights Law and Advocacy, uh, Susan Pritchett will be Pritchett will be giving that presentation. The Honduran Health Clinic out of the College of Health Sciences, uh, Linda Johnson and Joanne Theobald, and then Wildlife Conservation and Ranching Economics in Kenya's Savannas uh, with Jacob Goheen. Now all of these projects share that focus on addressing um, human development and, sustain and sustainability head on, really an applied research, kind of real world kind of approach to their projects, and they specifically are faculty uh, leading projects, students leading projects with faculty. So it's a very collaborative process, which is probably just precisely what we think of when we think of the university model. So, um, and they're, they're diverse, but I think you'll see the threads that unite them. I'd like to go in the order uh, of the, of, as listed on the program, and turn it over to Dick. Thank you, Jean. It is a pleasure to be here and uh, to share with you some of the great work that our students are doing. Um, as Jean pointed out, um, some of these are faculty-led, some of these are student-led. I can say this is student-led and faculty-observed. My role as faculty advisor for EWB is to encourage and to uh, assure students they have the capability and the capacity to do what needs to be done. Sometimes they don't think that they may not think they do, uh, or they don't have the courage to take that next step. And this really is um, a wonderful experience for me to be involved. Um, EWB USA is, a, is the uh, umbrella organization. Engineers Without Borders' uh, central office is down in Denver. The vision for EWB is, as you can see, a world in which communities have the capacity to meet their basic human needs. I'd say in the last 10 or 20 years, we've learned an enormous amount about sustainable development in developing countries. And it's not about aid, it's in about partnering. And it's about uh, supporting local groups so that they can take ownership of their projects, so that they understand the technology, so they can maintain and develop their systems. Um, all of that is a part of the EWB model. And we're continuing to learn um, unfortunately, sometimes by mistakes and other times by successes. Uh, for us, or for me, I believe that uh, the second last bullet there is really what's critical in having EWB at the University of Wyoming. It is an opportunity for transformative experiences for our students and it helps them develop responsible leadership skills. It gives them the opportunity uh, to acknowledge their responsibility for service. And in the College of Engineering and Applied Science, that's something that you don't see a lot. Um, as you might expect, and it's probably quite true on a stereotypical basis, engineers are jazzed by the technology. But I can tell you a large portion of those engineers are also more enthusiastic about the changes they can make in someone's lives by application of that technology. So the EWB approach requires partnering with a community in a long-term relationship. We're talking about five to 10 years. Use of appropriate technology to assure sustainability. We do not take a single piece of product, building material, uh, any kind of technology from the United States to wherever our developing community is. If you have to ship something and it's going to break, then they've lost. The, the functionality of that system. Everything has to be local. Uh, education and training are vital. We can raise the level of uh, understanding and of expertise within a community, but it still has to be done in a manner that's appropriate for that community. Um, EWB, you, uh, WIO, our chapter, was established in January of 2006. This was an outgrowth from the International Engineering Cl Club, which was started in about 2001. And student initiative started EWB, Engineers Without Borders. They were looking for more than study abroad, more than international internships. They were looking for that third leg 
of international experience, which is service. Our first project was to build a primary school in Chokmuk, uh, Guatemala. Our second project was a water supply project in Bita, Kenya, which is on, uh, on the lake, or very near the lake. The picture you see over there was our team, um, 16 students, um, two to four visitors, or kind of drop-in. It's kind of interesting to have drop-in traffic when you're on a service project like this. And then, of course, our Guatemalan compatriots, uh, masons and laborers. Um, I'm going to give you a snapshot of that project to really give you a sense of uh, what the students are doing. And then um, I'll have Callie uh, share with you some of the details of what EWB is into right now. So in uh, 2005, October 2005, while we were drying off after Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Stan blew through Central America, created mudslides that decimated the village of Panama. Um, this, the uh, highlands in Guatemala, and we were near, we're right on Lake Atitlan in this area. So all of this is a volcanic region, very unstable soils when they get wet. Um, so 700 families were left homeless. Uh, you may not be able to see the bottom of the slide, so I'll share that with you. Uh, hundreds of deaths. The hospital you see there was buried under three feet of mud and essentially became a burial zone for those who were inside the hospital. That was in October of 2005. We sent a student team there, uh, two students in October of 2006, to, to survey the, uh, the site and do an assessment on the project. Um, uh, the project that we adopted was to build a school in a new community which was built by the government. The community was built by the government of Guatemala to relocate families from uh, Panama. And the name of that community is Chokmuk. Here you see some, uh, not what you would call culturally sensitive uh, building layouts. In fact, um, there weren't very culturally sensitive buildings in the first place. Uh, neglecting much of the way that uh, the Mayan communities live. Nevertheless, uh, we helped build a school there. Our uh, architectural engineering team on this project uh, took the lead in designing the school. We cooperated with an engineer who was our primary contact, an engineer from Guatemala, who was our primary contact there on design specifications, material availability, and basically the, the program for the school. Uh, so the upper illustration is um, what we had planned to build, and then the lower illustration is the as-built configuration. You see a little bit of a difference on the lower left uh, from the upper, and that dealt a lot with the foundation conditions that we were forced to deal with. So uh, we get to the site, uh, myself, 16 students, and I'll mention an interesting statistic, less than 20% of the students in engineering are women. There were, of the 16 students here, seven women and nine men. So it gives you a pretty good sense of, uh, I believe, the interest and the, uh, the effectiveness of EWB in engaging um, women and their commitment to engineering. We did this work in December 2007 to January 2008, so four weeks over Christmas break between semesters. We got to the site, and uh, as you can imagine, um, a lot of digging had to go on in order to put, be, to put in footings. Um, a lot of rock removal, uh, volcanic uh, deposits in this area. And everyone worked and I, um, amazingly hard. Uh, for two or three days, we did nothing but dig foundations and haul rocks. We set up rebar tying stations, we mixed concrete, we collected all the materials that you need to build a school. CMU is a concrete masonry unit, so if you want to leave with a little engineering terminology, it's not a cinder block. It's a concrete masonry unit. <laughs> okay. Moving on then, uh, the handwork, I think uh, everyone contributed and every piece of work was vital. The school did not get built without the stirrups did not get built without separating out the fine aggregate in order to make or to uh, mix the mortar, without tying rebar and placing it in the bond beams. 
The little illustration I have up there under the stirrups, that is a vital little piece of steel that runs around in a loop and then the two ends are brought into the middle. Vital for um, integrity of the building in an earthquake environment. Does this mean how much time I've used or how much I've left? Okay. <laughs> okay. So she tied literally hundreds of these things. All right, uh, on the job training, uh, everybody uh, placed concrete, uh, placed concrete block, tied rebar. And uh, our motive obviously was to build a community uh, for the residents of Panama who had been relocated. So there's the completed building. Uh, it was opened in February of 2009, about a year after we left the site. Uh, we didn't get it finished, so it took some time to continue to uh, get the local labor to, uh, to complete the project. So um, I'm going to skip over very briefly, uh, the, I'm going to skip over the details, but I will offer that there's a lot of oversight with respect to safety, with regard to uh, protecting the safety, health, and welfare of our community, as well as that of our uh, participants, our student participants and uh, our partners. <coughs> So the challenges that we face with EWB is building communities, honest relationships, um, helping develop cultural awareness among our, stu among our students and among everybody in involved actually. It's different every time we go. Paying the bills, travel costs and project costs. I'll acknowledge uh, uh, major contributions to EWB from the Elbogen Foundation and while he was still alive, Tom Strook who was formerly uh, ambassador to Guatemala also uh, wrote a nice check to help us with that school project. So there's our clients, and this is the universal thing you'll, uh, that I've learned about international travel. Anywhere I've gone, I've seen the joy of the Holy Spirit in any economic environment. At any ne economic level, you see smiles like this. And here's the impact. The impact is on primarily, I believe, our student <coughs> groups. Not so much the communities we work with. There are, there's a host of um, NGOs and GOs and <laughs> other organizations that are doing service. And there's probably better, better models than the EWB model, but this one engages students so that they can understand both their obligation and opportunities for service. And uh, that's where I think the payoff is. So I'll turn it over to Callie. I'm happy to talk with anyone following this presentation if you have an interest of where Guatemala is at now. And actually, as of last week, I um, had to transition from the Guatemala program manager after three years of the assignments, um, thanks to Dr. Garrison with her friendly pushes to move on with my career into my life, so I won't be an undergrad forever. So um, let's see. As of now, we went, there was five of us that traveled to a new community called La Comunidad Maya, which is in the south of the country. So further south from where this uh, school project was, and we conducted what's called an assessment trip, and that entailed um, doing community surveys. There was about 905 people that live in this current community that we're partnering with, and we interviewed over 20 different um, families about what their water consumption patterns and uses are, and also just did a topographical survey and all these other data collections to um, hopefully as to go back and design a water um, distribution and storage system because as of now their current um, system is not supplying and meeting demands. Um, the pressure is insufficient in the system and so there's um, most people in the community, particularly those that are at higher elevations, don't receive water for most of the day and so most of the women who are actually up um, beginning at 3 in the morning can only get water from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning so they have to go and collect water and kind of store for the next day and they're not having, they don't have adequate water especially in the dry season. But again, I'd be happy to talk with anybody afterwards about where we're at now and um, can also use this as a recruitment opportunity because it's truly a wonderful organization. I am not an engineer. I'm a social engineer, as some of my colleagues might say. And um, I do think that my international studies training has been really instrumental in actually going in and assessing the community because when we go down and do any trips, there's so much more than engineering and technical data collection. It's truly building relationships and being culturally sensitive. And I think that my training here at UW with the International Studies Program has been really key for that. So pass it over to the next one.
everyone. My name is Susie Pritchett. I am a visiting professor and the Robert J. Golton Teaching Fellow at the College of Law here at the University of Wyoming. And today I'm going to be giving you a little bit of an overview about our Center for International Human Rights Law and Advocacy. The center is a relatively new part of the College of Law. It began in 2010 when Robert Golton, who had previously been associated with uh, DU in Denver, brought his international cases in his center to the University of Wyoming. He partnered with Professor Noah Novogratsky, who's in the audience today and, and continues to be involved in the center. And they uh, created the Center for International Human Rights Law and Advocacy at the College of Law. The center is a broader umbrella organization for three, um, uh, it, which has at the moment three characteristics. We have a human rights clinic, which is going to be the main focus of my presentation today. We also aim to bring in international speakers and people who can speak <clears throat> to the situation of human rights in the various countries that we work in or have an interest in. And then we also seek to facilitate internship opportunity, opportunities for College of Law students that would like to take their legal training abroad for um, the summer and partner or uh, be housed at a non-governmental organization that we work with in some of our cases. So the International um, Human Rights Practicum is an experiential learning opportunity that has handled, been handling cases, like I said, since 2010. Um, we have cases all over the world, and from this map you will see the different countries we have worked in. Our cases take two different forms. Uh, one form is international advocacy projects or cases, and this is where we are partnering with NGOs or other international non-governmental organizations abroad to work on either specific cases or advocacy opportunities. We also engage in domestic asylum representation, so students will um, uh, represent individuals who are already in the United States who are fleeing persecution in their country of origin because of their race, religion, membership in a particular social group, political opinion, or nationality. And for those cases, um, we have clients, some from the University of Wyoming campus that are here for studies or graduate studies, some that are here living in Wyoming and need uh, high quality legal representation, some that are um, referred to us through a Denver-based NGO called the Center for Immigration and Immigrant Services. That organization serves as an initial point of contact for recently arrived asylees and refugees, and we've become that organization's first point of contact for linking up uh, individuals who are seeking asylum representation with high-quality representation. And so. Um, the map you'll see here, we have either done a project in one of these countries or we have represented somebody who is from one of these countries seeking safety from persecution in the United States. <clears throat> Through 2013, we have had um, more than 37 law students who've participated in our legal clinic and have had a hands-on international human rights lawyering experience. Of these students, about 21 of them have received University of Wyoming support to travel abroad and work on international human rights cases. Um, some of them, some of the countries that they have traveled to include Cambodia, Nigeria, uh, Peru, Thailand, Mozambique, Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia. So we're really sending students all around the world to work on human rights. Uh, advocacy opportunities, which is which is exciting, and um, we've had a lot of support from the Cheney Center for those trips. So I'm going to just give you a couple of um, snapshots of the types of cases we work on, and uh, the f the first one I'll I'll touch on uh, refers is in reference to the picture in the middle and the bottom. I guess it would be your bottom left hand corner. We have partnered with an NGO in. Uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya, the NGO is called the Katiba Institute, but they are assisting an indigenous tribe of Samburu individuals litigate a 
land rights claims. So this particular tribe has been um, forcefully evicted from land that they consider their ancestral home. And um, the, the past president, President Moy of Kenya, is in part to blame for this eviction, as well as some other land holding bodies in Kenya. And this tribe has brought a claim asserting their right to remain on this property, both as a matter of adverse possession, which is actually an old, consti uh, actually a common law claim that stems from uh, the English common law system that we here in the United States inherited and also um, Kenyans inherited. So it's very interesting for students to be able to take something, a uh, legal concept that they learned in their first law property class in, in you know, Wyoming law school and apply it in a court in Kenya because they are practicing um, the, under similar common law concepts. So uh, students traveled to Kenya to appear uh, with um, to appear at the court hearing for the Samburu tribe. In the process of, of attending the court hearing, the students realized that there was a fundamental problem in the litigation in that it was unclear what piece of land the um, witnesses who were members of the tribe were talking about. And so the students themselves went to the Kenyan National Archives, conducted some very primary research to find a colonial map that clearly outlined the suit property that was under question and um, through partnering with local council, we're able to get that map introduced into evidence. So that case is still ongoing. We continue to be invo involved um, as litigation in Kenya tends to do. It has drug on. The judge that we appeared in front of has now been recused because of um, bias and other problems in his ability to be impartial. And so uh, the legal issue the students are researching this semester is how to request a, um, a de novo hearing or a new hearing based on um, the facts of this case. There are two options at this point. The case can move forward on the old record that the old judge created. And in Kenya, there are no recording systems. The only record you get coming out of a case is the judge's notes. The other alternative is to get a new judge and start the hearing over. And so our, um, the community that we're working with would prefer to have a new record and a new judge so that the case can move forward um, in a fair manner. The, uh, so the middle case down here is, um, is a, a picture of a student working um, with girls at an elementary school in Mozambique. They have um, students traveled to Mozambique and met with uh, students at this all-girls school. Unfortunately, Mozambique lags far behind in access to girls and uh, girl, women and girls having access to education. And we have drafted a report on the status of uh, women and girls access to education to present to the World Bank and to um, identify the legal responsibilities of officials in Mozambique to provide equal access to uh, education in that realm. And that project is also ongoing. So those are a couple of snapshots of different projects. We have currently, I'd say, about 30 active cases um, in total between asylum cases and, and international advocacy cases. The one I really want to focus on today is the oil governance project. We are currently partnering with a Ugandan-based NGO called the Human Rights and Promotion Forum, and their logo is there at the top. They are a Ugandan NGO that um, promotes respect and observance of human rights and really has a, um, a good relationship with the Ugandan government in terms of having produced a number of influential reports that have gotten the attention of legislators at the national level in Uganda. We have been, uh, we were initially approached by them to, because of our status as a Wyoming law school and our expertise around the area of oil governance, and they had asked us, you know, because you come from this oil producing state, because you seem to have knowledge in this area, would you be willing to help us think about the development of our regulatory regime from a human rights perspective? And would you be willing to partner with us in writing a report so that we can tell the government of Uganda that there is a, an opportunity here to develop our nation's oil industry um, from a responsible human rights perspective? And so, what we are currently doing is students here at the University of Wyoming are drafting a report that really breaks down um, different, uh, different methods of 
oil regulatory systems that can ensure that people who live in Uganda have their basic human rights met. Uganda is a very poor country. There are all sorts of human rights problems that happen there. We're working on another case that is trying to make the government accountable for women's health care. They have a very high maternal mortality rate. And so our, our work around the oil industry or around oil governance is meant to bring a human rights perspective to what potential regulation holds with respect to fulfilling human rights. Um, right now, Uganda is in the development stages in its industry. They have discovered oil. Um, they are estimated to uh, bring in to about $2 billion in oil revenues per year when oil production begins. Uh, at the moment, three foreign corporations have received licenses to, um, to extract oil in the company. None of those are U.S. companies. One of them is a Chinese company. Students are looking at the international instruments that bind these companies or other um, international governance structures that can help uh, shape these, gov these companies' practices and ensure that they are um, doing those in a way both environmentally and from uh, a revenue capture perspective that that um, are responsible and helpful. Then down the line, there's going to be refineries built and a pipeline. And so our report is going to address just um, how the development of those different pieces of the oil industry can be done from a sustainable and responsible perspective. So like I said, um, our students are, are co-authoring this report. It's been an interesting process of back and forth with the Ugandan NGO. They definitely have some good suggestions of what language is and is not well received by the government of Uganda. Um, our students have access to um, legal databases and a wealth of information that isn't easily accessible in Uganda for reasons of technology and um, you know, it's just, it's just not as easy. We have this database called Westlaw, and that has thousands and thousands of pieces of legal information available at students' fingertips sitting here in a law school in the United States. And so we're really helping to facilitate the flow of information between ourselves and our partner organization. In August, two of our students are going to be traveling to Uganda to conduct fact-finding on the ground to talk, about, to, talk to people who are being, um, who live on land where oil has been discovered to talk to the human rights organizations who will be promoting a human rights perspective in the development of this industry. And the report is going to be launched in Uganda on International Human Rights Day in December. And we hope to have students on the ground for the launch of that report as well. So that is all that I have, but I'm happy to answer more questions about any of our projects or the oil governance project in particular. We appreciate um, the university's support of our international work. We're excited to be able to do this type of work in Wyoming and um, have a global impact. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you who have given us the opportunity to come and make this presentation today about one of our very, very favorite topics um, and projects in uh, College of Health Science and, in fact, throughout the university. And that's what we have called the Clinica Agua Salada Project. This is a project that began in 2007 within the College of Health Science and now has grown into a, a project that has enabled many people throughout the university to come and provide the services and and demonstrate their expertise for, um, in the, within this project. This includes the UW Family <coughs> Residency Program, the Engineering Depro Program, <coughs> excuse me, the College of Law, Pharmacy, WAMI, Pre-Med Students, Nursing, Social Work, and Geology, and then within our community, we've also had community members come with us, which include um, dentistry, again, attorneys and physicians, and nurses that work within the community. We're very pleased to see that, again, this is also a very much of a student-driven um, opportunity, but we've also been able to, um, lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. This is very much a student-driven opportunity. And Oh yeah, excuse me, I've just come back at two o'clock this morning from our 14th trip to Agua Salada. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Steiner, who's looking for an excuse for me. Uh, no, okay. And, and um, so again, a student-driven opportunity. We take about 30 students, and yesterday we came back from our 13th brigade. Those are students from all of those different um, areas of, of um, healthcare, and not only healthcare, certainly the, the other the areas that I've mentioned. Joanne will be much more eloquent, I think. Okay. 
why Honduras? And this is a question that when we started to do some fr fundraising was asked to us. Certainly we have a lot of um, need within the United States for the kinds of services that we provide there. But um, Honduras is a very special place. It's one of the poorest countries in the world and has recently been designated as one of the most violent and dangerous countries in the world too. So that kind of gets everything exciting for our students sometimes. And their parents, their parents are very concerned about that. But. So over 65% of the citizens of Honduras live in poverty. We can contrast that to 15% of Americans. 30% of Hondurans live on less than $2 a day, and certainly this is the case in the area where we are serving citizens. They are living on subsidiary, subsidiary farming and also on um, a barter system, and certainly most likely on less than $2 a day. Um, I'd like to point out here where we <laughs> and we come to, to this cafe, and we come to this area just outside of Concepcion, right on the outside of the border, um, due to the topography and the, and the infrastructure of the country. That trip takes us about two days. We leave here on a Friday, and we get to our clinic on a Sunday night. That involves go fording rivers in pickup trucks, um, local bus service, and, of course, the airplane. So. This is Agua Salada, our, our community, what is it and what it is like. It is 25 square miles that includes 10 different smaller communities. You can see it's extremely mountainous. And whenever the students say, where are we going on a home visit, I always say up, because that's always the correct question. We will be going up. The village itself supports 300 people. This is the heart of the village, which pretty much is the, is the school. There are very few, the houses are dispersed throughout the mountains around this area here. Um, most of the people are farmers, as I said, and they work on f um, small plots of land. There are 10 elementary schools within this community, each consisting of about 48 students. That's a st uh, one to first grade to fifth grade. And then the students have an opportunity to go to Colegio, which is going from six to six. The uh, Colegio goes from the sixth to the ninth grade. We've been able to implement a scholarship program for our students to go there. Usually um, only about 10% of the students will progress to Colegio, the sixth to the ninth grade. If they want to go on to further education, they need to go to the bigger cities, San Pedro Sulo and Tegucigalpa. The nearest medical clinic prior to us the nearest medical clinic prior to us coming to this community was a, um, almost a three-hour walk. Uh, there wasn't a bus service to that country. It's through a lot of mountains and a lot of um, rough territory. This included women um, who were needing to have their babies delivered, and the government has recently asked that they do come to the, to the clinics for that. This is almost impossible for them to walk those three hours while in labor. I recently spoke to a mom who was going to go to the clinic expecting her third child, and I said, well, gee, I'm, one, I'm a little worried about how you're going to get there. And she said, yes, I'm going to have to walk very quickly. So I thought, well, yes, that's right. But, so this has um, offered an opportunity for us to do some research regarding traditional birth attendance and home birth and the recent change in laws in Honduras. And that's just a piece of some of the research that's coming out of our, of our work there. It also includes pharmacology, looking at how people look at pharmacology and what we can present to them and what they call Western medicine, which they perceive to be much more powerful, even it's the same IBM ibuprofen that they're able to buy and they, they perceive what we bring to them to be much more powerful so that's afforded a nice um, opportunity for our pharmacy students to do some research on that. We've also done some psychiatric research trying to um, look into more of the chronic illnesses that we know are there but we haven't been able to identify up to now and particularly we've um, started to do some look at depression and see what we can do about um, those kinds of things. Okay, there are, There's very little um, sanitary water in Agua Salada. In fact, the children, it's just considered something that one does. You have to, we have, parasites are endemic there, diarrheal disease, and so antiparasitic med medicine is something that's, that both adults and children take prophylactically every six months. Okay. Starting in 2007, the UW faculty connected with um, Shoulder to Shoulder. This is a group that was founded by two physicians out of the University of Cincinnati. They targeted Honduras as a country that needed help, uh, help with their um, 
healthcare and the health of their citizens. And they had the wonderful idea of thinking, boy, universities have wonderful resources. And so they paired universities with different communities within Honduras, and we were able to uh, be assigned Aguasalada, which frankly, out of the other 10 communities, is the poorest of all of those that have um, been assigned to other universities, such as Brown, University of Cincinnati, um, Commonwealth, University of Virginia, and um, Rochester University. Okay. We also work very hard to make a, um, we also work very hard to use a community model when we approach these communities. We do expect the community to be part of all of our decision making. And following that, we have um, had a committee elected that helps us with all of the decisions that are made. And we have meetings with them regularly on the brigades and also um, by our, um, by the shoulder to shoulder people that live in Honduras and help us out, okay? We have something that's offered at the community, at the, at the um, clinic called a consulta, and that usually, oh, shoulder to shoulder, okay, yeah. Okay, so shoulder to shoulder, it began in 1990. They, um, we have these uh, regular br brigade visits to the clinics. There are 13 clinics affiliated with those um, with those universities. There are two dental clinics, there's a bi bilingual school very close to where our school, where our town is, and the goal of the school, of the shoulder to shoulder was to improve the health care, of the health and the health maintenance of the, of the citizens of Honduras. Right, okay. We talked about the community partnerships meeting here, you see that is a, um, is a, um, is a community partnership meeting. I just came from three of those. They're um, pretty interesting. There are a lot of politics within the community that we, we need to take, in char take charge of, and we're also very careful that all of the decisions, including the building of our clinic, were made by um, the community at large. I think that um, this, pro this process has worked really well. It's a wonderful model for our students in all areas of study to see when we start to look at, at community partnerships and really staying away from that model of um, great white man comes to save you, as I like to call it. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, we, yeah, I think I started that. We, we go two to three times a year annually. We stay there for nine to 12 days. We see about um, <coughs> 400 people, sometimes up to 500 people a time, at a time during this time. We had a dentist with us who, pill, who pulled, we decided, for about 450 teeth during this last, um, yeah, yeah. It's his goal to stop pulling teeth and to start, in four days, it's his goal to stop pulling teeth and to start to look at some restorative dentistry. And so he's really taking, it's Dr. Larry Foyanini, we're very lucky to have him. And he did donate the dental, I call it the dental suite, it's not quite as sweet, but um, he did donate the dental suite that we used there. and. He's hoping very soon, within the next year, he's going to be able to stop pulling teeth and be able to do some restorative dentistry. We were very excited. We had someone come and ask for some dental floss at the last, um, at the last, um, at the last meeting. So. Okay. So we have two minutes left or five? Two. I didn't see the fingers. Oh, three. Okay. In between. Okay. I'm going to talk really fast about... Um, just kind of the on the ground projects that we've done. So before we, we actually constructed a clinic and so the project when it started was geared very much toward moving toward, we made a commitment that we we're gonna build a clinic there because Agua Salada falls in between the government contract for healthcare. So that's why they were having to travel such long distances. So here's some pictures when we used to do consulta in the church. And so that's what we did until 2012. So. Um, Land for the clinic was donated by a local woman, and we received money from very generous donors, of course, in Wyoming, as well as the university. And so we broke ground in November 2011. Hopefully that picture will come up. And um, we actually finished in July 2012. So being able to move into a clinic meant that we could leave medications there, because otherwise you were bringing everything down every single time. And so being able to leave things there meant we're one step closer to sustainability. So then, from 2012 really to now is when we're taking our, I guess, bigger leaps. Turns out the easy part is going down in brigades, right? Come down, come in, give some medicines, take care of some things, and you're back in your country. And now when we've moved into this place of engaging more in the community as far as community development goes, as in if the poverty wasn't so bad, they actually would have money to go and purchase medications or could have transportation, money for transportation to get to hospitals. So um, we've, 
since the clinic was constructed, we've hired two local employees, people that live in the community. One's a health promoter, and he's an auxiliary nurse, I think is what they call it down there. So somewhere between a CNA and an RN, LPN niche. And also, um, so he's providing some basic health care and being able to distribute some medications to people. Um, then we also hired a social promoter to help oversee some microfinance projects. So between the health promoter and the social promoter, we're working on kind of the economic as well as the health care. The health promoter also does health education. So we do a lot of train the trainer kind of things when we go down there. Um, social Work's role has been a lot working with education in the schools, and so that way we're doing train the trainers with the teachers there. For example, the teachers are mandated to teach English, but none of them can speak English. Very challenging, as you might imagine. So that's some part of the work that we're doing. Um, we ha now have five students um, that receive scholarships to go to middle school, and we're hoping to expand that to hopefully 10 for the next year. We made a commitment for three years. Um, so for us right now, the clinic's finished, although we're discovering in Honduras no construction is ever finished, and there's erosion, and there's other things, unforeseen things to deal with. Um, but we're looking at more of these more sustainable kind of initiatives. The big piece, however, is that we are coming close to getting our clinic established as part of the government contract. Healthcare is decentralized in Honduras, so our NGO Shoulder to Shoulder actually has contract to provide health care in the state of Intibuca. And so it's going to take about a year or two. It's a census taking process. The communities all have to agree that there's a need for the clinic. But once that's established, then the government will pay the salaries of the workers. They'll have a full-time nurse and a health promoter, um, as well as having access to medications, maintenance of the clinic will be taken care of, and they'll have access to any government program. So um, whether or not we get there is up in the air, and I think the big question for the university and us on the project is if we, there's our social promoter, <laughs> if we get there, um, if they're part of the convenio or the contract, then our role will change a little bit to be more what they call the plug and play, meaning we will come down there, continue to bring students, continue to do research, but we're kind of off the hook as far as this very huge responsibility, I guess, feeling that they have become a sustainable part of the healthcare system and do have access to healthcare. And then we can kind of move into that, these other areas more of community development. There's the first four our first five scholarship students. We're very excited to see a girl that was actually nominated. It's very unusual. Most girls after sixth grade end up um, living in, their, in the homes of their parents and the teenage pregnancy rate, of course, is very high. Um, there's the, that's, yeah, that was the, I don't know if you can go back a few slides to the clinic piece. These were all taken in the clinic, a couple more back couple more. There's the teachers. We also go into the schools and do public health education. And maybe one more back. I'm trying to think. We do midwife education. Sorry. Just backing up. And we do home visits every time we're there for the people that cannot come into the clinic. The clinic is really basically an L-shaped um, compound with a little building on this side that has a pharmacy and a dental room, and then the other side has some exam rooms. But the office, meaning where they come for consulta, is a big open area. And that was what the community wanted. That's very much is in style with, with what they want. And it, 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 even though it's larger than many of the buildings, than many of the homes, it does stick out. But it does look like the homes built of the same material, all with local contractors. Um, so I think where we go in the future is um, going to be interesting to see. I think a lot depends on the convenience, and we're supporting that as much as we can. Thanks. Great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for staying. Um, and thanks to uh, Jean for inviting me and insisting I talk into the mic. Um, okay, so uh, my name's Jake Goheen. I'm in the Department of Zoology and Physiology. Um, one of my big goals here at the University of Wyoming is to work with um, Kenyan nationals to improve the uh, strength and rigor uh, behind wildlife science in that country. So a big goal of our research program um, is to build intellectual infrastructure within Kenya. I was going to talk to you about a couple uh, different programs today that my grad students uh, are leading. Um, what we try and do is um, something that's very reciprocal in that uh, we try and take uh, University of Wyoming undergraduates, undergraduates who are majoring in things like wildlife and fish management, zoology, uh, environment and natural resources, and um, take them out into the bush for about three weeks to get hands-on training with how to 
uh, work with wildlife and they take those techniques um, back home and they um, apply them. Uh, the, the flip side of, of that is um, I take uh, graduate students from Kenya and bring them over here and um, we train them in things like statistics and GIS and remote sensing and scientific writing. Um, so the first uh, project that I want to talk to you about today is led by uh, this fellow, uh, Abdullahi Hussein Ali. He's a, he's a pretty amazing guy. Um, he was born in a refugee camp on the Kenya-Somali border. Um, he speaks five different languages. Uh, despite his rather stoic expression here, he's actually very delighted. And he's delighted because he's just found a scat of this beast. And this is the rarest antelope on Earth. This is called the Herola antelope. There are about 500 of these remaining. Uh, for comparison, American bison, which is a species that we tend to think of as being very rare, there are about 1,500 of those in the wild, and there are about 150,000 of those in captivity. In these, we have 400 to 500 remaining in the wild. There are zero in captivity. Um, so this is the rarest antelope on Earth. It's sometimes called the four-eyed antelope. You can see these big preorbital glands right beneath its eyes, so it kind of looks like it has four eyes. Um, this guy's a real stud because he has a hump on the back of his neck that's loaded with fat, um, much like a camel. Um, and this occurs entirely outside of protected areas, so entirely outside of national parks and national reserves on the, on the Kenya-Somali border. So I'm going to tell you three different punchlines um, that Ali has learned about this critter. And he's learned them, uh, he's learned these things uh, after about uh, four years of dedicated uh, field work. Uh, what Ali was able to do is uh, capture um, individuals representing nine different herds uh, in this area. And in those herds, there are about 50 to 60 animals. So we're talking about an eighth of the world's population. Um, what he has been able to show through GPS telemetry, so we fix these uh, radio collars on these antelopes, they take a GPS fix once every 20 minutes, and what you're seeing in the middle panel there are uh, movements of GPS telemetered Herola, so different herds of Herola. Um, if you squint, what you can see from that panel is that Herola avoid tree cover. Okay, so these are an open grassland specialist. They might do pretty well in Wyoming, but they do not do well where there's lots of trees. Um, <clears throat> the second thing that we have seen, and this comes from long-term aerial surveys, is that Hirola declines, interestingly enough, coincided with elephant declines in this area in, 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 in eastern Kenya. And uh, these big market declines in elephants were uh, due to poaching outbreaks in the late 70s and early 80s. And what I want you to note from this graph is that Hirola pretty much lagged behind that. Now, what's interesting about that is that elephants, when they move around, they basically they browse and they uproot and they kill trees. So by having elephants around, you're creating this really open um, kind of grassland habitat. And then the final uh, punchline from Ali's work, uh, this comes from remotely sensed imagery, is that tree cover has increased about 500% within the range of Hirola. And you can see that the range of that antelope has contracted markedly as tree cover has really expanded into this area. Um, so what we are trying to do um, we've, cr we've recently created a group called the Herola Conservation Program. This is founded um, on basically three hubs. The first of these hubs is community outreach to the local Somalis. Um, Ali is speaking to a group of them there. The second of those is enforcement and anti-poaching. Um, you see one of our collaborators there working on a de-snaring effort. Um, the third and uh, yet to be realized is an elephant um, restoration program, so in which elephants are tranquilized and moved into this area um, in the hopes that they mow down all of this tree cover, thus giving Hirola a foothold. And uh, we work very closely with locals in this uh, region. 
Um, interestingly enough, Somalis do not eat bush meat, they eat only cattle and goats. Um, and they ascribe to Hirola kind of a near mythical status because where Hirola do well, means that cattle also will do well. Um, so there's real hope uh, in this area for this beast. Um, the second and final project I wanna to talk to you about today is led by uh, PhD student Caroline Chibet and Bueno. Uh, Caroline works at the Laikipia district of central Kenya, north of Mount Kenya, uh, just a little bit. And this region is actually uh, quite representative of much of East Africa. Uh, when we see East Africa on the Animal Planet or Discovery Channel, um, we see these huge herds of wildebeest through all these lions or something. And if you show someone from East Africa that footage, they'll ask you, where are the people? Because it's very hard to go in East Africa and not see people. That stated, humans and wildlife actually coexist um, alongside each other in many of these areas. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a typical landscape in Lycipia with the two most common ungulates. By ungulate, I mean hoofed mammals. So we've got cattle and we've got plains zebra. Um, for Caroline's work, we're going to talk about two observations and two questions. So two of the observations um, that we've seen in Lycipia since about the mid-80s is that several species of antelope including hartebeest, waterbuck, eland, and buffalo have declined markedly through time, whereas plain zebra and cattle haven't changed much. They've fluctuated a bit, but they haven't really dropped like these four uh, antelopes. The reason for that is that plain zebra and cattle are controlled by rainfall, and we suspect that hartebeest, waterbuck, eland, and buffalo are controlled by lions. Um, so these declines have occurred with an increase in tolerance by local ranchers for things like lions, spotted hyenas, etc. So these four species have tanked with the growing acceptance of large predators and that has led ranchers in the area to think we need to do something, right? We need to control these lions. They're overpopulated. Um, <clears throat> observation number two, zebra prefer to graze in areas where cattle have just been, okay? So where cattle have been corralled. So what you see here on day one is a boma. This is a corral. Livestock management in this neck of the woods is very different uh, from what it is in Wyoming. In Kenya, you would be insane to leave your cattle out overnight where things could eat them. If you have a cow eaten by a predator, it is your fault, not the predators. So a very different mindset um, than we have in the Intermountain West. So on day one, they established this boma, this corral, and day two, they put cattle in there. And after about a month, there's this nice circular ring of uh, cow dung and urine, and it creates basically this fertilized hot spot, this really good, delicious green grass that in turn functions as a zebra magnet. Zebra are really attracted to this stuff. So after about a year, you get these big aggregations of zebra where you've had these cattle corrals. <clears throat> so those are the two observations. Now we've got two questions. So keep in mind that we've got antelopes like these hartebeest that have been declining through time, and we think that's driven by lions. And also keep in mind that despite lions suppressing numbers of these things, they exist or they subsist primarily on zebra. So imagine that you're in a high school cafeteria and it's lunchtime and all the students show up for lunch and there's something really gnarly that day for lunch, green bean casserole or something. But there's a single piece of pepperoni pizza. That pepperoni pizza is going to go like that and it's gonna go by virtue of its proximity to the green bean casserole. So this is the tasty stuff for lions. This is the pizza, and these are the green bean casseroles. Okay, so what we're trying to do, or what Caroline is trying to do, is use these bomas, these cattle corrals, to change where zebra occur on the landscape, to create these aggregations of zebra, and in so doing, 
direct the hunting activity of lions, basically pulling lions away from these declining antelopes, okay? So question number two, if she can do that by changing where lions hunt, can cattle be used to bolster numbers of hartebeest and other declining antelopes? Because if she's right, this provides a way that we can have our cake and eat it too, without having to re-implement lethal control of lions, simply by shifting around where ranchers corral cattle. Um, so how do we actually do this? Well, um, we have uh, telemetered lions, lions with GPS collars on them as well. I'm sort of a one-trick pony. I do what's called collaring them and following them. So <clears throat> um, much like the Hirola, we collar lions, and we get a GPS telemetry fix on those once per hour. We've developed an algorithm that tells us when there's an amount of clustering that looks like this within the span of a day, we go in on foot and we look for kill sites, okay? Because where lions are sedentary and they're hanging out, it probably means they're on a kill. Um, so that's how we identify um, kind of the needle in the haystack, where we go in and look for kills. And the prediction is very simple. And that it's that we should get fewer kills of hartebeest, as seen here. Uh, we should get fewer kills of hartebeest away from those corrals, away from where the zebra hang out. And so that's what we're testing right now. And Caroline's in her first uh, season of field data collection. And um, I think she's got a great idea, and I hope it'll work. One of the final things that Caroline does that I'm really proud of her for doing, um, as unusual as it is to have a Kenyan national come over here and work on wildlife science, it's almost unheard of. To have a female do that, I've never heard of it. Um, and I'm really glad that she's done it. Um, she has foregone an employment opportunity with the Kenya Wildlife Service, um, which also is almost unheard of over there to earn her graduate studies. And as part of that, she involves uh, students from this Kenyan orphanage called uh, the Daraja Academy in her studies. So she trains them how to do things like use Excel spreadsheets, how to drive, um, and so forth. And these are highly coveted skills in Kenya. So um, this uh, ecological research, I think, is really having knock-on effects, and I'm proud of her for doing that. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Um, since, if I'm not mistaken, all of these programs are, are student led or student directed or something along those lines. So I'm curious to know how you guys feel about how these experiences will really benefit the students, both just mentally and also in their endeavors in the future. I know for law students, um, something we've been moving toward is is emphasizing that it's impossible to practice law in a globalized world without having some sort of international issue or nexus to your practice. And that's, you know, we always think in, in Wyoming, we're, we're not a border state and we maybe are more isolated than some other states, but there are all sorts of industries in this state that have some sort of international um, aspect to them. There are people living in this state that might need immigration advice or want to adopt a child from abroad. And so we really um, hope that the students who participate in our international clinic will take the uh, opportunity and experience of having practiced international human rights law with them into practice, whether they end up as a local um, defense attorney or somebody practicing trust in estates. It's, it's bound to happen that they're going to have an international issue come up in their daily practice. So we think it's important from that perspective. I would answer for the medical health care professional. We're now living in a different kind of environment. And that is um, something that is becoming very interprofessional. For a person of um, my experience and my maturity and my profession, that's something that we didn't see a lot of. Yet this is definitely the wave of the future. 
I think this is an excellent opportunity for our students to be able to see um, truly an interprofessional team. And when we're there, um, we're pretty much on an even playing field. There isn't that hierarchy of uh, medical care that you can often see in the workplace in the United States. So that's a real plus for our students. I also think that it really pushes the student to recognize what they have learned in a way that they're not always able to recognize in their clinical areas here. Nurses, as an example, know a lot of things. And I feel in Honduras and in the clinic there, they're, able, they're very much able to recognize what they do know. And that way, they're getting a lot of confidence about themselves as professionals. But um, they're also able to push the envelope, not, not beyond their scope of practice, but be able to push the envelope of what they can do as professional nurses. And I would say that's the same also for our pharmacy students. They're just amazed. They're like third year pharmacy students and they can go in a very safe way and run a pharmacy that takes care of almost 500 people. So that's fabulous for them. I also very briefly would like to say, yes, we're also very much interested and committed to global health care. We do not live in a vacuum any longer. And what's happening in Africa could be happening here, as we've seen with some of the, um, the scares of um, communicable illness. We also see that um, things are changing as far as moving from communicable illness to chronic illness, and that our um, students have an opportunity to see that change in a, th in a developing country. So. They all come back thinking it has very much changed their life. They come back to us even five years later and say that really changed my life. It's changed their course of what they want to do with their lives as professionals. And they also have a deep understanding of what it means to live in poverty for taking our American students. Yesterday we took someone who had never been out of the state of Wyoming. Now they were in Honduras just yesterday. And so um, I think that that's a lesson that you cannot describe to someone in a classroom. And as a public health instructor, I cannot describe in a classroom what that means to live in that kind of poverty and have those kinds of um, health challenges. Yeah, I, I think these are all really great programs. I'm just wondering what kind of challenges you run into um, and if you run into any resistance either from the community or from the central government. Well, in Honduras, it's interesting because the country would completely fall apart without NGOs, without groups coming in. So not, they, uh, not so much in the way of financial support. And when you try to do certain projects, there's a lot of obstacles there, bureaucracy, you know, things you have to jump through. Um, but overall, support is of us being there because I think it's helping to avoid civil war. Um, you know, the, the long-standing corruption in, um, in the government and, and the, the, just the whole, the whole system, how things work down there. So not so much resistance there. I think um, the challenges for us are just looking at this huge gaping hole of need and trying to figure out how do we, how do we even accompany the process of the community as they try to address this when you have unsafe water and a, a place that just had electricity and that has this, you know, you could, well, Linda listed all those things. So I think that's a challenge for us is knowing how to start, where to start, how to keep going. Um, and it's like, it's not even one step forward, two steps back. It's like feeling sometimes like you're falling backwards and we're trying to kind of claw our, ways, our way back to that. So, um, and the community, this is hard to say, but since 2007, since we've been going, the community itself looks pretty much the same as it did. You know, the houses are the same. There's a few more stoves, but um, so what have we really done? And I think we struggle with that a lot. And so I think that's where we're at now is facing that. So um, for us as a board and as a whole project, I think that there's a lot of pain in that, right? Because we want to feel like we're, we're, we want to be there doing something. But I would agree with the statement earlier on that it, we know it benefits our students, right? Probably more than it's ever benefited the community. There's a lot of constraints. But we keep trying. You, know, you don't want to do nothing just because you can't do something. I think if it weren't for the... Uh, inexhaustible energy and dedication of our students that uh, this wouldn't be po any of these projects wouldn't be possible they spend an enormous amount of time on fundraising so that's a huge constraint or a huge roadblock uh, the bake sale approach to raising thousands of dollars is just not very effective so uh, what it does do though is it raises awareness and that's critical too um, 
challenges we face in countries is developing an honest relationship, um, really getting to know and understand what the community needs, what the community wants, and whether they're um, savvy enough to exploit the opportunity that, that we provide. So uh, that's a real challenge. Oh, and with regard to resistance, I've never seen any. Uh, not on, on campus uh, or in the community or uh, any of the countries we've been to. Thank you very much.